back you up into uh, the steam talk. Steam talk, these people are staring at the talk. Uh, uh, talk for today. Uh, as part of STEM Week, um, I'm presenting uh, the presentation that I called together called Earth Rocks, Music of the Sphere. Basically, you know, it's kind of a fun little title that um, ties in the fact that um, all solid objects make sounds, they, they vibrate. And those vibrations usually lead to sounds. But at the same time, acoustical waves are more than just sounds. The science of acoustic includes any sort of kinematic or kinetic response to um, disturbance, basically. I'll get into that later. Um, but I'm focusing on on, uh, on the Earth here, on, on geology, on geophysics. And you're going to learn about geophysics. Um, geophysics is a branch of geology that um, sort of focuses on the physical aspect of, of phenomena within the Earth and, and phenomena of uh, spherical, you know, bodies, otherwise known as planets. Also, geophysics makes use of physical sensing methods to understand the Earth. And I'll get into that a little later. But anyway, so, listen to a little bit. signal of a block of rock sliding down um, a vent in the Mount St. Helens that was recorded. It's actually recorded and turned into a file. It wasn't even a sound. It was recorded back when the event happened, like 1980. And um, the researcher who um, was part of this um, sort of movement to uh, create modeling techniques that, that make use of our auditory equipment as well as our visual equipment. Um, took the file, raw data, and translated it mathematically into a sound. Okay, we'll get into that in a minute. Okay, so here, now I want to qualify this. But this this presentation is part of Earth Science Education, so this presentation is actually geared to. Um, High school and even middle middle school students. It's uh, you know if you bridge the gap, you know sort of um, create interesting um, tidbits to maybe make people understand that science is real it's everywhere. It's around us at all times. It's a, a method of understanding the real phenomenological world. Does the earth make sounds? Yes, it does. I mean, you ever been to a quarry? You hear rocks drop, smash into each other. You've ever been near a volcano? Um, I haven't. I really want to. Just keep that in mind. I have witnessed a mudslide. I witnessed a rock, rock slide in Colorado at the uh, Valley's Caldera. We were looking across this huge valley with these rocks and made of rhyolite. Those of you in my geology class, what's rhyolite? Jamie? Volcanic? Igneous? Come on. It's the volcanic version of granite. It's a felsic rock. Anyway, so there's a bunch of this stuff there. And we're standing there on the ledge, you know, after a long day of hiking and doing stuff. And this whole section of cliff fell just spontaneously. It obviously had, its lifespan was gone. Fell, and it made a huge sound that resounded throughout the valley. It was really cool. So there's a sound right there. Or if you've ever been in an earthquake. Um, 
I've been in minor earthquakes, um, which sometimes they sometimes happen. When these events happen, they produce waves of energy within the earth called seismic waves. And seismic wave is a type of acoustic wave. Okay, it's energy. It's the energy of the atoms smashing into other atoms or molecules and bouncing into each other and propagating. Like water waves. Take a little pebble, throw it into a pond, see the water waves move. It's a disturbance that causes all the molecules and atoms to bump into each other in some sort of a very honestly, usually predictable way. Okay? The motion of atoms and molecules. Energy. And now I'll just put it away up there. So I got most of my stuff to read and look at is what the picture was there. So energy that's released during earthquakes um, is measured on the Richter scale. Okay? And it's an exponential scale. The energy that's released when two blocks of, of rock, two tectonic plates slip or a block of rock breaks with an interplate event rather than an interplate event, this energy is enormous. Even a small earthquake is enormous energy, and energy is exponential. The one that happened in, in uh, South Carolina a few years back was equivalent to like, what, 400 tons of TNT. That sounds like a lot, but, you know, comparatively, you look at this, the drop in the bucket. I mean, the largest earthquake ever recorded was actually one of the shocks was 9.4 on the Richter scale. Multiple megatons of atomic bombs worth of energy. And it was in Chile. Chile is, is very well known for its earthquakes. These waves are part of acoustical waves. And they can be translated. Anything that you can measure quantitatively you can translate into some other form to read it as an instrument. For instance, heat is transformed. Heat energy is measured from the surface of the Earth by geographers using electrical instruments. And they just do some math to translate it. That's what is happening here. Now I'll tell you who does this in a minute. I'll just mess it up. Oh, I'll explain it that way. Okay, a photograph is an example of something that translates kinetic or kinematic energy in certain cases. I won't get into what the difference is right now. But it translates that energy into sound. The little record, the vinyl record, I don't know if any of you have ever used the vinyl record. They're really cool. Who here has played vinyl records? Awesome, awesome. Music fans, good, good, good. Well, no, I'm sure the rest of you are fans, but Getting into records is the geeky part of the whole thing. So the little needle hits the grooves and it vibrates. It vibrates very minutely. It takes those vibrations along the tone arm and sends them to some sort of coil that translates them into electrical signals. And those electrical signals are sent to an amplifier, which translates them into another type of signal, which goes into the speaker and spits it back out as a sound. Okay. This happens all the time in engineering, especially physics-based engineering, electrical engineering. This is this is normal. When an earthquake occurs, there's a break in the rock. Okay, it's either two plates slipping, which is called an interplate earthquake. It's an interplate event, or it's a break in a plate. It's a break within a plate. It's an intraplate event. Okay, the spot in which the break occurs is called the focus or the hypocenter. If you're in my class, I'm not going to ask you to remember hypocenter. You'll just remember focus. Okay? And that's where the that's where the business occurs. But directly above it, directly above that on the surface of the earth, okay, perpendicular to the actual imaginary plane of the surface of the earth, of course it's not plane, but for our from our perspective it is, is the epicenter. You often hear when people talk about earthquakes, the epicenter. Well, the epicenter is important because that's the, one of the first physical expressions of what happens beneath the Earth at the top of the Earth. And what happens at the top of the Earth here on the surface 
is extremely important for us human beings. Because earthquakes cause a lot of damage and people lose their lives in these events. Um, an earthquake, now one concept I want to go over, this is on that slide, is when earthquakes occur, those vibrational waves, they propagate out and they don't stop. You may have heard in geology class that when an earthquake happens, it's like the earth is a bell and it's struck. And the waves just keep going back and forth, back and forth, until they just die out. And they go back and forth throughout the entire earth. Okay? You're going to see some, some seismic signals here in my presentation that were taken possibly thousands of miles away from the event, but they create very strong signals because of that bell-like quality of the earth propagate seismic waves. Two major types of seismic waves are body waves okay, and there's surface waves. Body waves simply travel through the interior of the Earth. Surface waves are the waves that occur on the surface of the Earth. And they're linked to the epicenter, which of course happens, which is the expression of what happens in focus. Two types of body waves are P waves and S waves. And there's several different types of surface waves. Uh, the most common ones are the love and the Rayleigh waves. And we'll get into what those are. First body wave, the P wave, it's called the first horizon. P waves are sound waves. Sound is a compressional wave. It's, it's I don't have a slinky, so I'm not going to be able to demonstrate with a slinky. I just remember. Okay, well, I'll do it in class. So, you know, do it in class. Okay. So Basically, it's um, a force going forward, compressing whatever's in front of it, bouncing off of it, shooting forward to the next layer of, of rock or layer. It's very forward, very, very, very direct from the actual source. Okay. Now, these waves are shear waves. They're not that way. They go up and down. Okay? They, they travel perpendicular to the direction of propagation. And they don't travel through liquids. Liquids don't shear. And this is why you have a shadow zone around the liquid outer core of the Earth. When these waves hit the liquid outer core, they stop. They're done. But the P waves, these guys, the compressive waves, keep going. Because as we know, sound travels, if you've ever been under the water in a pool, sound travels through water. First type of surface wave we'll talk about are the Rayleigh waves. These are known as ground waves. They travel like a water wave. This is like a water wave. Basically, nothing's moving. It's just the wave is propagating through the media, and the media is actually not moving. Sound waves are different. You're actually pushing something. Sound waves are like pushing. This isn't like that. It's called ground roll. You see, you see that little roll sort of a backwards circular arc, okay, that's what we mean by ground wave. Water behaves like that. Very destructive. You can imagine turning solid rock or a surface of the earth soil into something like water and you can cause a lot of damage. Love waves travel side to side. Okay? They have great amplitude. They tend to have the greatest amplitude of all. Possibly because there's nothing preventing them from propagating. Because if you're going to travel from two phases, if you're going to do dual phase wave propagation, your wave is going to become attenuated. What do I mean by attenuated? It means the wave dies down, the amplitude dies down. So if you're, you've are you got sound emanating from a rock or something solid and it's emanating into the air, it's going to die down a little bit. But these don't. They're going back into the rock, side to side. And these cause the most damage. This is the most Life and limb loss. Lots of property, lots of life. Okay. These, are, these are what seismologists look for when they're dealing with hazard um, remediation. They're dealing with actually saving people's lives. And, and I hate to say it, but I didn't bring my slinky. But in a classroom with high school students and middle school students, I will remember a slinky. And um, you can push it, and you see the little coil bump into each other compressively, you go up and down, do a shear, go side to side. You can't really model Rayleigh waves in these 
for the swing. It's kind of hard, but you can model the array relays with a little bowl of water and drop pebbles. That's pretty easy. Let's get back to the concept of translation. We're taking one energy type and translating its values into another energy signal. Oh my God, we got a slinky. Let's do it. Anybody want to? There you go. There you go. Okay. Is our, is our lovely lab assistant Fred? Turn on the light. Yeah, you're going to turn on the light. You're going to, um, let's do, oh, 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 we're hitting the, hitting the camera. Okay. Um, so, what we're going to do is we're going to do a compressive wave first. This is a P wave. I got you got to stretch this tight. Man, these are see where where Pam get these things? This is ridiculous. Oh, it is. Got to install it. Okay. Stretch it out as far as you can. Okay. Here is a compressive wave. And it's not doing too well, but it, it, you get the picture. Yeah, see? That's it. That's it. And let's do that again. Okay, you got that going. Now let's do a shear. The shear wave. More or less, not a very perfect one, but that's a shear wave. Yeah. And, and actually what Fred's doing at the same time I am. That's apropos because earthquakes, as you know, occur in bundles. Okay, you have aftershocks, you have foreshocks, you have an earthquake event happening, and it activates another fault somewhere. This happens all the time. That's a shear wave. Okay, let's try to do a love wave here. That's not so easy. Side to side. Well, actually, you just jiggle it like jelly. <laughs> Must be jelly because jam don't shake like that. Anyway, that's a love wave. Now, I need to bring a bowl of water in to demonstrate Ray Lee waves because that that is a ground wave. That's that's liquid propagation. There you go. Have a slinky. Thank you. <laughs> wow, I never thought of that. Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay, so back to translation. Those things you just saw, which are kinetic waves, or kinetic kinetic responses to um, their responses to a kinetic event. In other words, they are kinetic, a kinetic response. Not get into the definition of kinematic. Kinematic basically is a response to a kinetic event is like this. I hit the table, that's kinetic. But the kinematic response is all the other stuff that happens. Okay, we won't get into that. But they, we, you, what researchers do is they translate these waves into some other form of signal that you can put into a form that you can understand a graph or a sound. We discussed how Richter magnitude, me magnitude measures movement and it can be mathematically transformed into an energy equivalent. This is what happens when a record player vibrates, it's transformed into something else at some point, an electrical signal, which is then retransformed into a vibration signal that you hear in your speaker. Energy signals can be related to other energy signals too. Some some are directly translatable. Some phenomena have the same math as other phenomena. Water transmission in the aquifer. We're doing water now in the lab. So energy transmission in the aquifer is a potential, is potential flow. Okay. Well, voltage is a potential flow. The math for voltage and the math for Darcy's law, which is the transmission of water in a saturated regime, is the same thing. They're the same thing which makes it easy. So the P waves in an earthquake are the same as the sound waves which you hear in my voice. It's just they're really, really low. They're subsonic. 
we can't hear. Maybe this is why certain their animals get agitated right before an earthquake. Maybe. Who knows? But what's done is you take those signals, those sound signals, and speed them up so that human beings can hear. Science, you, the, the science of geophysics is when you use signals, physical signals, to understand the Earth. Here's a Schlumberger array. Okay, this is where you take two poles and you create an electrical field. And you measure the resistivity in the rocks and the water beneath you. In fact, this is, this is the go-to method to find out where your water table is. Schlumberger array. It's one of several. Okay? It's called electrical resistivity. It's part of the whole science of geophysics. Okay? This is, and this is how people do geological exploration. Okay? Because when you want to find oil, it's really expensive to drill the what they call wildcat drilling the well. But it's less expensive to just take some seismic creating and measuring equipment, even some dynamite, and get some seismic geophones out there and measure the signals that are sort of propagated through the earth. And you can read those signals and understand where oil might be. This is what oil companies do. Okay. My work here is directly taken from, and I'm directly promoting the work of this man right here, Dr. Jigan Kang of the School of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences at Georgia Tech. He's a geophysicist. Uh, primarily a seismologist, I believe. And he is one of the people that has been doing a lot of work in creating sound files out of seismic events, out of the waves that he, he um, gathers during seismic events. And he's a geophysicist, a scientist who utilizes energy to understand how the Earth works. And um, he, he's done some amazing things. So he's, I've got to give him a shout out. He's, uh, and he's, every time I call him, he's like, go oh, ahead, go ahead. Human beings don't have a very large range for hearing. In other words, we can't hear, we can't even hear P waves, which are basically sound waves. We have to speed them up. But we do have very sensitive ears to it. This is why music exists. Because we can pick up nuances that a lot of other animals apparently can. Okay? So our ears are excellent scientific equipment. They're excellent scientific instruments. We've got good instruments here. Not very powerful instruments, but very sensitive instruments. What Dr. Payne does is he takes the files and he runs them through a computing environment called MATLAB. The compressive waves are sped up. The other types of seismic waves which do not translate to sound at all. They're not, they don't behave like sound. He, uses mathematical operators to transform into sound waves. Okay? And then he generates, he uses, he uses MATLAB to generate animation files in quick time. Okay? And they, they, they match up. It matches up very well. And he, he does a lot of math to make this happen. Okay, this is um, the main shot recording of the, uh, the earthquake. The earthquake responsible for the Fukushima disaster. Okay. You see the uh, right there, those are your those are your P waves. The first arrivals. The next ones are your shear waves. It happens in this sequence. P waves, P waves are the fastest waves. First arrivals. And the second body wave is the shear wave of the second arrivals. And the third bundle is all of your body waves. So those are red. Those are the slowest, actually. The most destructive waves are actually the slowest. Okay, here's some aftershocks. Remember I said earthquakes, when Fred was doing this and I, he, and, and I was doing the same thing, well, that's kind of how it happens. You have aftershocks, you have events that happen at the same time, depending on the arrangement of the um, plates and the cracks in the earth. Um, depending on whether you have four shocks, four shocks happen. You have small, minor earthquakes as, as the Earth is sort of moving in place or as some event is about to happen. 
These happen in bundles, but they're, they're not isolated events. They're all related, more or less. These are aftershocks. When the aftershock happens, that's when you start to see a tsunami. That gets so much additional damage to the core of the Speed of the wave and, and sped it up, and he gnashed it 
to something that you would read on a seismograph. So he has to he has to take something that's already modeled using a seismograph and change the actual sound to where you can hear it. I mean, the sound that we hear is somewhat qualitative because you're taking various types of acoustical waves and putting them together. And they're not, they really aren't all the same. But he has matched them up time-wise to where you see the events occur in real time. Yeah, I have another question. Yeah. How do you know that there's an earthquake trigger in Cuba by events in Chile and it's not just coincidental? That's a good question. Um, what they do is using, see, earthquakes don't, aren't just amplitudes, they also have vector properties. And using instrumentation that they have, they can measure the vector property of the wave, how, where it propagated from and how it propagated. And they can model what happened to the trigger tremor. And if the map lines up, if it's, well, you know, this amplitude traveling in this direction at this time would have caused this, then that's the smoking gun. It's a good question. Okay, um, this is the one that caused an enormous amount of damage. Um, very tragic um, event in Sumatra in 2004. This is that earthquake in the Indian Ocean that you've heard about. Um, taken after the fact, of course. But, um, you can see why this kind of work is so important because you're not just doing science for science sake, you're actually helping people's lives. And at the time, they didn't have a very good monitoring system for earthquakes or tsunamis in the Indian Ocean. That's a very it's a very different story right now. Yeah. So this is the this is the big one from two thousand four. I don't know if you guys remember it, but it was all, all over the news. It's a horrible, horrible thing. Again, he took this file after the fact. I don't think Dr. Payne was working in this area at the time. I'm not sure when he got his doctorate. This was a long time ago. This was over 10 years ago. So he got the raw data that was already recorded, already, already on file somewhere, and ran it through MATLAB, did all the transformations, matched everything up, and created that. Probably why it sounds so funny towards the end. But very interesting stuff. This is the one that happened on February 14th last year. I heard a big explosion from the southeast. It may not have been this earthquake, though, but it may have been. People said they heard explosions. People in Athens, Georgia. Anyway, so, oh, I was mistaken. It's actually 60 tons of TNT equivalent, magnitude of 4.4. Remember, earthquakes are an exponential scale. So, and I think it's, uh, it's like 86 times each jump is like, I believe, 86. It's not 100. It's not exponential based on 100 based on something else. But it's an enormous amount of jumps. You go from 4.4 to 8.8, that's it, they don't even compare. That's like a stick of dynamite versus an atomic bomb. It's here. It's small, but it registered. <laughs> Now, um, earthquakes, earthquakes aren't the only events that cause, that cause tremors in the earth, that, that cause earth materials to propagate acoustical waves. This is a uh, recording of a meteor impact that occurred in Chelyabin, 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 that helped me, I didn't say that, I Chelyabin. Chelyabinsk, Russia. And it was this huge swarm of meteors that became meteorites because they hit the Earth. 
And you may have seen YouTube videos of people running and, you know, mm -hmm. the, the, the meteors hitting buildings and stuff. Well, they recorded it, and it makes, it makes, it creates seismic waves. how we know North Korea has set off some nuclear explosions. Look at the magnitude. The magnitudes are all four to five. That's small nuclear bomb. Okay. Well, I took one of the files. It was a file that um, he got after the fact, much, after, much later after the fact, from Mount St. Helens. It's a, a block of a, a rock called Bayside, which is an intermediate rock, guys who are in my geology lab. And uh, it was sliding down a vent in Mount St. Helens. And um, this is the sound of it. I took it and looped it and put some music to it. It's sliding down. It's sped up. Thank <laughs> you. 